I'm going to go over some of the deficits, and they really share um, similarities with the various cancers, but head and neck cancer, the deficits are very common amongst patients who've had brain tumors. So we all know that someone with head and neck cancer can have difficulty returning to pre-morbid, meaning prior to their illness activities. They can experience weakness, they can experience fatigue, they can experience pain, be it musculoskeletal or neuropathic, meaning like nerve-related pain. You can, you, you, can, you can actually feel tightness related to scars, scar adhesions. It can affect your swallowing, speech problems, shoulder problems, headaches, limited jaw excursion, limited ability to move the jaw, muscular asymmetry, meaning that your body may be not as even as it was before due to certain types of treatments. It can affect your ability to move your neck, cervical range of motion. It can affect the posture, including your scapula and your back. It can make it wing out, basically stick out at one, in one direction. Cognitive problems are a big deficit in patients who've had brain tumors. By cognition, I mean memory, attention, concentration, higher level cognitive skills. Balance problems, gait, meaning walking, falls. Chemotherapy-induced polyneuropathy is a very big neurologic um, effect of certain types of treatments, which I'm going to get into. Radiation itself can cause um, tightening and hardening of the soft tissues, something called radiation fibrosis syndrome, which can benefit from stretching and therapy. You can have difficulty with various types of activities of daily living, the things we need to do to take care of ourselves on a daily basis, as well as to interact and integrate into the community. Patients in their recovery process often need various types of durable medical equipment, adaptive equipment, um, instructions on how to begin an appropriate exercise program. So many of these things are, are challenges that are being faced by patients with head and neck cancers. But again, the focus is on the treatment, and sometimes these things inadvertently get overlooked. When we talk about metastatic cancer, by metastatic I mean cancer that is actually spread, so it's not the primary site. But patients with brain tumors uh, can have not only primary brain tumor, a tumor arising from the brain itself, but also a spread from another primary site of cancer. Many of the same deficits can apply, and it used to be thought that patients with metastatic cancer um, cannot and should not participate in exercise or rehabilitation. Now we know that that's a that is not the case. We strongly recommend patients with metastatic cancer to be able to be um, actively and fully engaged in an exercise and rehabilitation program. Um, of course, we need to be careful if there are metastases to bones. We want to make sure that it doesn't put any patient at risk for any type of a fracture. But again, it's not a contraindication to exercise as it used to be felt it was. Um, lung cancer, very often patients with lung cancer may have metastases um, to their brain, which can cause um, a brain tumor. And these patients share many of the same deficits, but can also have some unique issues to deal with. By treatment of the various treatments that they can receive, the, there's a bundle of nerves called the brachial plexus, which can be damaged. And if that bundle of nerves is damaged, it can cause weakness in your ability to move your arm and care for yourself by using that arm. And then breast cancer is very common as well too. I know this is not a, a breast cancer talk, but I really feel I would be remiss in talking about any type of cancer rehabilitation without talking a little bit about breast cancer, especially since it's not uncommon for us to see patients with breast cancer who may have experienced some metastases to the brain as well. And they can have some unique issues to deal with that may not present as problems for other patients, one of them being lymphedema, which I'll get into a little bit more, one of them being post-mastectomy pain syndrome, as well as, again, the brachial plexopathy. And um, it's been shown that 20 to 40%, so that, that's a great deal, that's um, one out of five to two out of five breast cancer survivors will develop lymphedema. Lymphedema is the swelling of a body part Usually one of the extremities, it's the accumulation of protein-rich fluid, which can cause swelling and that can cause impairments and difficulties with range of motion and ability to care for themselves, and also can lead to increased risk of infection. 
Again, I won't spend too much time on it, but lymphedema can cause, in the early stages, soft pitting, meaning you actually can press your finger into the swelling, and it can, it can cause an indentation and then bounce back, soft pitting edema. Over time, the skin becomes hardened, so it becomes fibrotic. It begins to take on different changes in the appearance of the skin. And there were different stages. There's stage zero where someone is at risk for lymphedema, but they haven't developed anything yet. And that's called latent or subclinical lymphedema. Stage one, you begin to have early accumulation of fluid. Stage two, now you begin to develop some hardening and you may not have that pitting anymore. And stage four, it's, an, it's already very um, fibrotic and by that point, unlikely to respond to therapy. And these are pictures of the various lymphedemas um, in the different stages. Stage zero, all the way up to stage three. So, how do we treat lymphedema? Um, we treat lymphedema through complex um, decongestive therapy. And that is a type of therapy that has to be performed by a specifically, um, specially trained therapist using special exercises and compression wraps and special massage techniques. Again, I just want to briefly touch on this. It's not the main focus of what I'm talking about today, but it is something to be aware of. What I do want to get into, though, is chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, also called CIPN. So according to the 1980, just to give everybody a background, in 1980, the World Health Organization came out with some specific definitions of impairment, disability, and handicap. A lot of people may use one or the other. They're not necessarily equivalent. They're not interchangeable, but they are all related. So an impairment is a physiologic dysfunction or a loss of anatomic integrity. So if you can't use a certain part of your body, that's an impairment. A disability refers to the functional consequence of having an impairment in relation to the ability of oneself to care for oneself and related to mobility. So if you have an impairment, if someone gets their leg amputated and that's an impairment, obviously it causes a disability in that person's ability to get around until they get rehabilitated properly. And what's a handicap? Even though we call everything handicap parking, the truth is what handicap really means is that the impairments and the disabilities affect someone's ability to integrate fully and socially into society and recreationally to the way that they would like. So how does this all relate to chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy? Um, many cancer survivors suffer from this type of neuropathy. It causes pain and it causes disability because it it impedes that person's ability to function as much as they would like to in society. Um, and again, I went over the difference between impairment and disability. But even when there is an impairment, such as nerve damage, chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, there are techniques that can be done within the scope of rehabilitation to help someone deal with the disability caused by that impairment. Chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy occurs when either a single or possibly even multiple chemotherapeutic agents are used, and very often these drugs may be toxic to peripheral nerves, to the nerves that come out towards the end of our um, limbs. And they're usually most noticeable in a stocking glove distribution, very similar to the type of neuropathy nerve disease that a diabetic may get. So it's in the hands and the feet, stocking glove. And um, it's also known that there could be some improvement after the drug is stopped, but it could also um, persist long term. It usually, again, as I said, stocking glove, numbness and tingling. If there is recovery in the first few weeks, that bodes to the best prognosis. But it's been shown that there has been prognosis, um, good prognosis with some recovery up to two years out of treatment with these chemotherapeutic agents. We use different medications to treat these neuropathic symptoms, these pains, different types of um, medications such as Lyrica or Neurontin. Some of you may be familiar with these medications. We also prescribe certain protective type of footwear as well too. So if someone was treated with a chemotherapeutic agent and it caused them to have nerve damage and they had pain, which 
which, which limited their ability to use their hands or to walk as much as they would like, there are techniques that can be done within the scope of rehabilitation to hopefully at least somewhat help those symptoms.